All right, hello all. Tonight we're going to be doing uh, sections two and three of chapter two. Um, but before we get too far into this, I want to just discuss a couple things here. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, some equilibriums and uh, some velocity models. You'll find the velocity models to be really pretty straightforward um, because they, uh, for the most part, are separable situations. So that's really easy to do. Um, simply, it's a matter of you know the applications of a differential equation. Um, as far as equilibrium solutions go, they're they're really quite straightforward. Um, so what I want to do tonight, though, is start off with something we were talking about last week and that or the other night, which was the logistic equation. And you might remember that um, logistic growth was something along these lines, dp, dt. By the way, I'm expecting a phone call, so if that rings in a few minutes, I'll have to pause you. I apologize. This guy's been, I've been trying to get a hold of this guy all week. and Oh, yeah, I'll have him call you right back. Yeah, right. Anyway, what you might notice is this. This is a rate of change, yes? Cool. Um, well, what if the rate was zero? What if the rate was zero. Well, if it was, then nothing would be changing. And when that happens, we have what's called equilibrium. Okay? All right? And so in this situation, it literally is as easy as set it equal to zero. Okay? And so in this case here, clearly when P is zero, and when P is 100, we have equilibrium, because that's the values that make it equal to zero. Now, different books do it different ways. I like to draw them this way. Here's P, here's T. P to, T doesn't have any impact on the solution in this case, so I'm not going to worry about T, but I'm just going to draw it like this anyway. Here's zero. I'm just going to draw kind of a dashed line along zero. And I know that if the population was zero, you wouldn't have any fish, let's say, so duh, how about that? And up here at 100, we mentioned the other day that that was the carrying capacity. Well, and that's the same idea. So. If you put exactly 100 fish in there, that's where it would stay. Nothing would change. But the question might be, well, what happens in between them? So if you come back up here and you say, well, let's pick, a, let's pick a value like P equals 20. If you put 20 into there, this is positive. This is positive. <laughs> so in between here, you'd have positive slopes. Meaning that it's growing away from this bottom one, but always increasing, so it must kind of do something like this up here at the top one. It's still going up, but approaching that value. What happens if you put like something in like P equals 110, for instance? Well, this would be positive. This would be negative, which is exactly what you'd expect if you put more than 100 fish in, it would tend to do something like this. And of course, again, the case of if you have negative fish, which of course doesn't make sense in this case, but you could have models where negatives actually might make sense, just not in the case of fish. If it was down here, you would see it'd be a negative slope, and that's because back in the original equation, this would be negative, this would be positive, negative times a positive is a negative slope. Okay? And so we can graph these, we can do graph all kinds of them. We'll come back to that one in a minute. I want to look at him a little bit more. Suppose you had this one. Oh my goodness, there are one, two, three zeros here in this case. And, and of course, of course, they're negative 6, 2, and uh, 0. So you know, I like to draw them like this. Here's negative 6. Here's 0. Here's 2. Again, your, really your choice how you want to draw them. I, I just prefer to go horizontal. And the book that the high school is using, and it's only this way because that's what PSU teaches out of, draws it a little different and weirder. And it doesn't really, I mean, it's fine. I just don't care for it as much as this one. So let's pick a value up here bigger than 2. So bigger than 2. Okay? So if y was bigger than 2, if that was true, so like say 7 for instance, well this would be positive, this would be negative, positive, so we would have negative slopes up here, yes? The idea is it would be coming down something like so. What if you had 1? So some number in here, but say let's say 1. Positive, positive, positive positive slopes in here, so they must be doing this thing again. What about a number like negative 2? This is negative 6 down here. What if you had negative 2? Well, negative, 
positive, positive, so negative slopes in here. So again, it must be something along those lines. And what if you put like negative 7 in, something that's down here somewhere? Negative, positive, negative, so a positive slope. So it must be doing something like this. Now, each of these kind of equilibriums has, you see, some designations to it. This one up here at 2, it's, they're always approaching, regardless of what side you're on, they're always approaching it. We call this a stable equilibrium. If you're laying on your back on the ground, you are about as stable as you can be. Uh, that's because you can't really fall down. Uh, you're very stable. Everything tends that direction. It's fine. Uh, other times, you could be balancing on, like you could be standing, balancing on your tiptoe on the end of a match, uh, a broomstick or something. You are very unstable up there, and that's the case with this one here at zero, because if you look at unstable, that's because if you get just a little more than zero, she's going to take off, or a little less than zero, it's going to take off, and it's the idea that it's going away from it on both sides. This one, of course, down here is stable because it's, oh, everything's coming towards it. Uh, you might see this one in a dark alley sometime and be scared of it. Don't be. It's not that bad. Yeah. Wait, what? Exactly. If you saw this one, clearly... Oops, well, <clears throat> okay, now clearly. Clearly, when x equals 0, we have an equilibrium. Right? Now, again, it's x and t. It's right here. Well, what happens if I put in a positive x? Well, if I put in a positive x, what do we get? Well, we get positive slopes. That is, it's the idea they do this. Okay? And this is not the one I wanted to do, but that's fine. It's, it's a good practice. If x is less than 0, of course, we get negative slopes. Again, it's unstable. Cool. Nice. Uh, yeah. Let's do that one. Nice. So zero, one are my solutions. Yes, zero and one. All right. So if x was zero, we'd have zero. And if x was one, we'd have zero. So again, if you were to sketch these out, something like this. Well, here's 1, here's 0, okay. If you put in a value less than 0, say, let's say x equals negative 3 or something. Well, this would be negative, that's positive, that's negative, we'd have positive slopes down here. On the other side of 0, let's say, put in x equals uh, a half or some, some such, okay. All right, well, this would be positive negative, negative, so positive slopes here as well. And then at 1, all right, on the other side of 1, let's say x equals 2, for instance, positive, negative, positive, so it's negative slopes up here. So the idea is they're coming down toward this guy, they're coming up toward this guy, so again, stable. However, this one's a little weird, positive slopes. So notice how it's approaching on one side down here. It's approaching this. It's going away. We call these ones sometimes semi-stable equilibrium because it depends on which side you're on. If you're on one side, it's going to go away. If you're on the other side, it's going to come towards. And you're going to be asked some equations like that, talking about it. You know, you know what do you know about them? What's the kind of thing, deal it is? Now, in this case, we just have dx dt. x is a function of t. Later on, okay, we'll have we'll have x's and y's both be functions of t's and we'll th we'll talk about equilibriums in that case too but a little differently but we will call this one where they come on both sides it's stable like this later on when we will refer to this as a sink everything is going towards it okay and very much like a chemistry or physics problem this one here is a source because everything is emanating from it okay like so and, and so that's, those are usually used more in the, I have a systems of equations, some x's and y's being functions of t. In the case of, for instance, a predator-prey model, which I keep saying, hey, predator-prey. But we will get to these eventually. 
And there's this happy medium population right there. I don't know, 220, 10,000 or something. I guess we're guessing more prey or predator than prey. But over time, if that's like a happy medium, what you'll see is it'll go out and come back and maybe something like this. And, and, and that might be a situation where it's a stable center where things might emanate from it. We'll talk more about equilibrium in a different way when we get to, to systems. But today, you're only going to be looking at just x as a function of t. Oh, for God's sake, this is embarrassing. There we go. Sorry about that. My humble apologies. I wonder if I screwed that up anywhere else. No, I think we're good. Okay? So that's that. Now, last time we talked about the logistic function, and we said, and so I'm going to start off with the same one we did last time, or I had earlier on the page, I think. I think it was this one. Is that right? No. Nope. Yep. Got it. Perfect. So here we are. And I want to go ahead and solve this guy, where P naught is 20 or something. So then the idea here is it's separable again. So 1 over P, 100 minus P, DP is equal to 0.01 DT. And then, of course, if you do, um, what I want to say, uh, if you do uh, partial fractions and separate it out so that it's, 1 equals A 100 minus P plus BP. And if you distribute that, you'll get 100A minus AP plus BP. Well, there are no P's, so we know that B minus A has to equal 0, which means B has to equal A, right? Furthermore, we know that A is equal to 1 one hundredth or 0.01 which means so is B, which means we can write this thing as this instead. Right? Which we know this is 0.01 ln of P. Uh, really have to do a U substitution here. Hopefully you can start doing these in your head, you know, after a while. Oops. Well, I don't have a negative DP, so I pulled the negative out front. So it's going to be minus 0.01 ln of 100 minus P. By the way, it's interesting to note, the population can be bigger than 100. It can be bigger than 100. So, but if it was bigger than 100 and these absolute values weren't here, we'd have a problem. But because they're here, it works just fine. Now remember, the other side is still equal to 0.01, yes? If you integrate that, you're going to get 0.01t plus a constant. Okay? Now, these both have a 0.01 in common, so if you multiply everybody by 100, you will get the ln of p minus the ln of 100 minus p equals t plus a constant. So if I see subtraction, what I really see is this. If you exponentiate, you get p 100 minus p equals c e to the t, right? If you multiply this denominator to both sides, you get this. By the way, you could just call that C if you like, but I'm going to leave it that way. Move this feller back to this side. Factor out a P. Divide by, and this is this is just something that I would do because I'm weird that way. I like to write this function like this because I think it means a little more to me when I do it that way. So it's going to be 100 because that's my carrying capacity. 1 over C is just C, and then over E to the T becomes E to the minus T 
plus 1. And again, the limit of this function as t goes to infinity, the limit is 100. That's the carrying capacity. Okay? That is, again, assuming that your initial population is, is bigger, than, uh, bigger than 0, less than 100. Well, bigger than 0, I should say. Okay? So then it said that the initial condition was 20. So you get 100. And then c plus 1. Well, to pull that off, this would have to be a 5 down here. That means that this has to be a 4. Ta-da! Now you're like, well, okay, you showed us this last week. That's cool. And if I go and graph that, it should show up looking very similar to what we saw when we graphed our equilibrium solutions, right? Because this is just another... It's just, it, well, I shouldn't say it's another way. It's... it's, it's uh, what we're doing is finding the exact solutions, whereas um, in that when we graph, oops, when we graph the equilibrium solutions, those are the equilibrium solutions for sure, but but they don't really maybe mean as much to us as as when I actually graph the actual function. Oops, Did I missed something. Apparently, I missed something. Where it happened over here? Okay. Maybe I missed something. It all feels pretty good. It feels pretty good. Um, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Interesting. We may have a little fly in the ointment here. So, one moment, please, while I figure out what I screwed up. Uh, don't you love it when you screw stuff up? Clearly I dropped the minus sign somewhere, eh? Oh, it was negative right there, you dope. There we go. There we go. Now it's going the right direction, huh? That makes me feel a little better. There we go. Now, anyway, so that's it. So it's logistic growth. And clearly there is a zero. If you had zero, there'd be none. And then look at that. It's approaching 100. Well, who, th who knew? Interestingly enough, the 4 is the only part that changed, right? So if I told you that initially there was 200, then the bottom would need to end up being like a half, right? So, I mean, that, that the whole bottom would have to end up being a half. So I'd have to do 1 minus 0.5. Oh, interesting. And so initially it's at 200. It would drop and approach the equilibrium. Okay, so... That's pretty neat. Okay, neato, whatever, Jay. Can you show us it in Excel? My George, I think I can. Uh-huh. Wee! Okay, come on, give it to me. Come on. Okay, my little my keyboard today, or my screen, is not recognizing my fingers. It's like I'm dead or something. I have no, I have no, uh, whatever in my fingertips today, apparently. Yo, what is up with you? Ah! What is wrong with you? One moment, please. I'm having a technical difficulty. I guess we'll do it the hard way, maybe. Uh, no. There you go, dummy. T, P, D, P, D, T. Ah! And, of course, you know, step. Again, I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing. So, let's say I start at zero. We know that. And we had 20 initially. And our slope, so it's equals, right? 0.01 times P times parentheses 100 minus P parentheses bam <coughs> and the step size I'm just going to do 0 0.01 just for grins <coughs> and so remember when you're doing this you need to have it so you're predicting for some value so let's say I want to do it for time equals 2 or something right so here it's going to be equals this plus the step size. That guy, man, you need to put your dollar signs in there. 
my keyboard is not working so this is going to be very awkward oh there they are not too bad I guess drag this baby down actually I won't, I won't get too carried away with him right now I'll drag him down more in a minute okay so P is equal the original plus the slope times the step size don't forget your dollar signs bam and of course this guy is just this guy like so notice how the slope keeps increasing well let's go for a drive come on come with me uh, yes let's go on the interwebs that's a good idea there we go good enough whatever so at 2 we're predicting it should be 64 okay um, that's what we're predicting now we know it's headed towards 100 so let's keep going away and see how long it takes to get up oops see how long it takes to get up to 100 just for fun Wow. Okay. So, didn't take very long at all, and we're right up there. So, right around four, we're up there. So, let's go see if that's what the Desmos looks like. I didn't really pay attention. Maybe you did. Uh, yeah. So, oops, I changed it, didn't I? I was a plus four initially, I think, right? Boom. And again, if you're if you notice, if you're playing along at home, you realize that yeah, right around four, yeah, that's about right. So, like four point, four point, four point six six is 96. Let's go see what that looks like. Oops. 4.66 is 96 point something. Yeah, that's pretty good stuff, Jay. So, again, you know, always be able to come back to that. Always be able to have an idea what to go on with that. It's pretty slick. Now, you're like, show us something cooler. I will. I will. Maybe I will. I don't know if I will. I need my stupid keyboard, and it doesn't want to play. So, let's do this. Let's go to Insight maker yeah so proud of myself today i made this model now you may recall we talked last night about this we said that there was some birth rate minus death rate right this is when you see this it's exponential growth or decay depending on who's bigger right and then we said well if we take that same idea and go well you know but as time goes on people have fewer kids so the birth rate goes down so it becomes beta naught minus beta 1 P minus delta and then times P. So this bit changes, but it's still the basic general shape. That's why it has this part of it here that looks like, you know, exponential because it's related. They're kissing cousins. Now, what I've done is I've made myself a population. I've got a flow coming into it like so. Up here, I've got three variables. One is for death. One's initial birth rate. One is for, you know, newer birth rate, whatever. I don't know. Whatever beta one, whatever you want to call that. And I've linked all of them to this flow. And I've linked the population to the flow as well. So what I've done is I've come out to this thing here and uh, I'm logged in. Um... Oh crap, I saved it. Where is it? Oh no. Can't I open one? Well, that's funny. I saved it. I wonder if I can open it. <laughs> open? No. 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 What's that one? I have no idea what that means. Oh, it's a new one. Well... Um, Well, I didn't want to do it again, but okay, let's do it again. Sure, why not? That'll be a good time. Um, leave page. I'll try it again. All right, so it's out of stock. Let's call him population. Oh, jeez, I have to get this stupid keyboard open again. There's got to be an easier way to do this. All right, let's call it pop. Let's make it the initial. Oh, this is going to be really old. So 
sweet I guess all right so then uh, yeah okay cool so then uh, let's go up here and grab a flow oh this is gonna suck oh yeah so you gotta drag in from the middle out I almost forgot I always forget that stop it give me a flow there we go and remember what you want to do is change the direction of that thing and then remember Make sure you allow both rates. It just get in the habit of doing that. Otherwise, it's just screwy. Okay, what do we call this? I don't know. Change in population, I guess. We'll wait a minute to label everything. So there's a variable. Let's add another variable. If you don't move them, they keep putting it on the same spot, which I guess is one is fine. It's just a little annoying. And then, oh, this is really annoying. Why can't I just? Uh, new birth rate. Okay, whatever. I don't care. And I'm just going to make it... Oh, for crying out loud. Is it going to work? Are you going to work? It, ah, it started working again. Yay! So, 0 0.01, I guess. Why not? And this one here. Uh, old birth rate. By the way, things can happen where you could have a, a different death rate too, I suppose, right? Yes. And so old birth rate might have been something like 0.06 or some such, hypothetically. And then that new variable is uh, death rate, whatever. And then, and then it gets you some links. So link these guys. And link them. And then link to population as well. There you go. Now, <coughs> excuse me. So if you click on, oops, I didn't put a death rate in. So the death rate, we gotta get some people. We get rid of some people here. Yeah, they're losing two percent a year, I guess. So initially we we're giving birth at six percent, and now we're gonna get rid of it one percent. So if you click on the flow, and it's a little hard to do sometimes to get the flow. If you click on this drop-down menu here, this pops up. So what I want to do is, is to put in, oops, I want to actually type in my function. So we know what my function is going to look like. It's going to look like, um, um, well, I should, let me back the train up just a skosh. Let's go back over here and look at this map over here. So you remember yesterday we, we, we did this a little bit further and we said, well, you could rewrite this as, ah, uh, you could rewrite this as beta naught minus death, right? Minus, and then minus uh, beta one times p, and then times it out, right? And then we did that, and we said, well, beta, uh, well, we did it a couple of ways. I don't remember which way I did it, but I've done it numerous ways in my lifetime. So I'm going to pretend I did it this way yesterday. If, if I didn't, just play along with me. I'm going to go ahead and distribute, right? But I don't like that because that's that's an ugly function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor a p out, okay, and I'm also going to factor out a a uh, a beta one out, okay, and that's going to leave me beta naught minus delta over beta one minus population, okay. And so when I type this thing in there, this is equal to dpdt. This is my flow. So when I go to type this thing in, I want to make sure that I get it typed in appropriately. Again, let's go see if we can make it happen. So beta 1. So that's my new birth certificate. Birth certificate. My new birth rate. So click on this. Click on the, yep. So new birth rate times population times parentheses parentheses and it's old birth minus death parentheses divided by new birth times oh yeah oh minus rather minus population parentheses apply now, theoretically, when I hit simulate now, it should graph it. 
Oh no, what went wrong? Something's screwy. Okay, so we got to be careful what's happening here. Okay, now, um, so what's going on? It's going down. Population is going down. That's just, well, weird. So let's first of all configure this graph so we only have population on there. Okay, so it's dropping, and that, that's just really a little odd, isn't it now, after all? But what's it dropping towards? Well, it's dropping towards something. What, what's that something it's dropping towards? I don't know. So let's change things up a little bit. Let's change our window. And I want to change my Y min minimum to zero. And I want to see what... Zero, you hippie. Oh, say. Now let's let time go... Let's clear this out of here. And let's go. let time go a little longer. Let's let it go out to like 100 seconds or something. Or, well, 100 years, I guess. Years, seconds, days. We really didn't specify what this is right now. And, and we don't really care right this instant. Oh. Say it's approaching something. Holy crap, this one's approaching four. I wonder why that is. Because, oops, not there. Try again. Because over here, we had this thing right here, which looks to be... A carrying capacity. And if you were paying attention, which I wasn't, because I think I put in 0 0.06 minus 0 0.02 divided by 0 0.01, this comes out to be 4. And that is why it's dropping off to 4. Well, I want it to go up, darn it. Well, if I want it to go up, okay, then I only have to start off my initial population with a lower amount. So let's, for instance, get, get rid of that. Click on your population. Let's make our population... Let's make the initial population 2 instead. If you simulate that, oh buddy, oh buddy, hey that's pretty. And it's going to approach 4, but this time it's going to approach it from the bottom side. And again, I really just want you to keep that in mind. What are we simulating? What are we modeling here? How does it work? How is it related? Who's related to who? Who are the players in this thing? And then you can go and model it. And of course, there's actually a way, if you're careful, there is a way on these guys that I think it's right here, slow show slider uh, value. You can actually, yeah, right here, you can actually change that, okay, and you can go in and tweak that. And you can actually change it so you can see, well, what would happen if I tweak this? What happened if I tweak that? And you can do it for all of them. Matter of fact, I think you can do it for population. Uh, yep, slow slider value. Sure, why not? So then you could schmuck around with the initial population too. What if it was more? What if it was less? And still simulate these things. So we're, again, we're going to use this coming up. So I want you to get comfortable with it. That's why I bring it up again in today's lesson. Now, as far as velocity models go, they're very straightforward. Matter of fact, I think I've done basically the two of them that I talked about. Um, uh, and, and they're pretty straightforward problems. Um, you know, it, back in the day, it was, I believe it was Newton who was the one that postulated that your, the resistive force acting on you is proportional to your velocity squared. And that's really not true. It, it's technically, it, it depends on how things are oriented. It might be proportional to your velocity. But in reality, it's somewhere between, between 1 and 2. Okay? And I think they say, is, is, is you go faster and faster and faster, you get more resistance. So it's more like it's two, but if it's lo lower speeds, it's more like one, okay? But think about this, you've got a force that's pushing you upward, this is your resistive force, right? And you've got gravity pushing you down, the force of gravity pushing you down. And so you get a total force that's equal to, well, mg minus, right? mg minus, and I always have to look on this because this always irritates me and I don't know why it irritates me. So just bear with me one moment while I unscrew this up. Okay, I just I hate screwing it up because if I don't do it right, then the whole thing is screwy and then you're all mad at me and it's just a mess. It's terrible. I hate it. All right, just make sure I write it correctly because it's very annoying. Okay, there it is. All right. All right, so let's write it this way. So the force, the total force, the net force, if you will, acting on you is the force of gravity plus the resistive force, yes? Of course. Well, what is the force of gravity? Now, I'm going to write it this way so that it makes sense, is at negative mg. Now, for some people, you're like, I don't like that, I want g to be already negative, that's fine, just go with it. Man, I'm just gonna do minus kv for right now, okay? 
alpha. And k is just some value right now. Okay. Now, um, what I'm going to do, okay, what I want to do to this guy is I would like to be able to not talk about forces so much. I would like to be able to talk about accelerations. Okay. Now, let's think about this for a minute here. Right here, this is, we know this is some mass times, your, your mass times the acceleration, right? That's what, uh, that's what Newton said. Well, what is acceleration? It's just dv dt. Well, wait a minute. What happens if I divide everybody by m? Well, then I get dv dt, which is a differential equation, is negative g minus, and then your book uses this. They define k over m to be equal to rho. Because why not, right? Because why not? And so here's the deal. Your velocity is negative, right? So this will be acting opposite of the be op the act you'll be acting opposite of you. That's the idea over here. So just keep that in mind when this works. It does work, I promise you. Now, this is a separable differential equation. It's just v, so I can move it over here. Before I do that, I'm gonna leave the negative one over here on this side and take just the positives with me if you don't mind. Um, and so it's this over g plus rho v. Well, let's integrate that. So it's negative t plus a constant. And then if I let u equal g plus rho v, then du is equal to rho, right? Yes? And so it's one over rho du is equal to dv. So it's gonna be one over rho times the natural log of g plus rho v. Times by rho. Exponential. Oh, you hippie. Exponentiate. Minus g. and divide by rho. Now watch carefully what I do there. See that? Still a constant. Now it's at this juncture that you're like, wait a minute, what happens to this equation? Well, if my initial velocity, let's say, was, oh, I don't know, 20 or whatever it is, well then I'd be 20 would equal c minus g over rho you'd have to know what rho is in order to solve, obviously, for c, c uh, g being 9.8, of course. And we can do that, but we're not gonna do that right this instant. But what's more important to me is this. What happens as t goes to infinity? In other words, what's the limit of this equation? This piece goes to zero, and your velocity approaches negative g over rho, aka, that's right, terminal velocity. Now, in one of the projects, the one I keep bringing up about the parachute, which is like my favorite probably, you're going to collect some data. Notice that you have, well, you know, I mean, let's, let's come up here, let's be honest. You know what m is, okay, so that's not hard. So all you don't really know is what k is. Okay, cool. But wait a minute. Uh, you can look at this in a, new, a number of ways, but if you wanted to think about this, if, if, if a person were to, I don't know, you know, keep track of some of this stuff, you could probably get a pretty good idea for what for what rho would or k would have to be, so then you would know what rho is. You have a pretty good idea what those values are by collecting data, and that's how you're going to do it. And we're going to talk about that more as time goes on. But this guy right here is terminal velocity, okay? And so it's kind of a kind of a neat way of doing it. Um, it's kind of a neat thing how that works out. Um, another one is well, what happens? It's same exact thing. But what happens if it's proportional to the velocity squared? And so it becomes negative g minus rho v squared. To make sure I write that stupid thing right. It irritates me every time I write it wrong because you're not paying attention to something. Oh, crap, I wrote it wrong. Nope, that's right. Good for me. Good for me. Now, it is too a separable. So again, I'm going to leave the negatives on this side over here. Oh, and while I'm at it, for no apparent reason, right at the moment. I'm going to factor a row out of both of them. Oops. 
a negative row out, right? It'll become obvious in a moment why I did that. But for right now, you're just kind of like, okay, I guess. Why are you doing that? But so, yeah, I promise it will come into, into play here momentarily. Now, for those of you that just took Calc 2, this should start to look vaguely familiar. It's not fun, but it should look vaguely familiar. So negative rho t plus a constant. That side looks vaguely familiar, yes? Oh, wait, what? Oops, this should be a plus sign right here. Sorry, my bad. Ooh, say, doesn't this, I mean, just look at it. Look at it. Doesn't that look an awful lot like x squared plus 1? Right? Kind of ish. And if it looked like x squared plus 1, wouldn't it be arc tangent? Oh, it would be arc tangent. Weird. And what does arc tangent look like? Uh, something like that. You mean it's approaching some value? It is. Correct, approaching some value, which would normally be pi over two, but not not in this case. But it would be ordinarily, but it wouldn't be in this case because we're going to do something to it. But it is going to be an arc tangent function. Now, arc tangent of what? Well, I don't know. How do you do this problem here? Okay. Well, you may or you may not remember, right, that it's u squared plus a squared, right? If you have u squared plus a squared, one over that. It's the arc tangent of, I want to say it's u over a. Why is that so hard for me? Arc tangent of u over a. U over, it is u over a. By God, I'm right. Good for me. Your book doesn't show it. You just, I just had to memorize it. But I mean, I just look at it from memory. And I'm like, oh yeah, duh. But now who's a and who's, and who's u? Well, u is v, obviously. Right? And, but A, then, is the square root of G over Rho. So if I do V divided by the square root of G over Rho, oops, it should come out to be V times the square root of Rho over G. True? Nice. God, I'm getting good at this crap. So, when I look at this, this is going to be the arctangent of v times the square root of rho over g inside. Okay. Got it? Cool. That's interesting. Now wait a minute. I need to solve for v, which means I need to get it out of this mess. So I take the tangent of both sides. Something else that always makes me happy when this kind of thing happens. Freaking tangent just showed up. Why is tangent here? What in the heck is tangent doing here? This is a this is an airplane situation or something, for goodness sakes. Why are somebody's falling out of an airplane? Where did tangent show up? That's all about triangles and circles and crap. What's going on here? That's just weird. But in fact, there it is. That's what I really like about math stuff. Because every now and again, you're like, what? just happened. That is so weird. Now, how would I find out what C is? How do I find C? Geez, Mr. Groom, I'm glad you asked. Take your feast your eyes right there, friends. Check my math, but isn't C equal to arc tangent of V times square root of rho over G plus rho T? I think it is. And then you could plug it in, you'd be good to go up. So, some pretty easy models in that regard. Um, clearly, when you get into um, clearly when you get into some of the other stuff, uh, what I want to say, when you start your project, you're going to see some pretty cool stuff, and you'll be able to do some. Uh, you'll be able to do a bunch of them numerically as well, because you have a pretty good idea of what's going on with them. It's kind of fun. Yeah? So, you know, lots of different ones are going to show up. Um, I think pretty much all the ones I assigned you are eh, fairly straightforward-ish. Nothing too exciting or weird. Um, one that I always find fascinating is, this is escape velocity. Your book goes through this derivation, but I find it interesting to look at it just for fun. All right. 
So the change in velocity is acceleration, which is the second derivative of, you know, of, of, of um, a distance, if you will. And for in gravity, the universal gravitational constant is, is this thing, right? And it's negative because you're heading towards it, okay? So the idea being is that when you've got gravity, it's pulling you inwards. It's always opposite the direction you want to go, if you will. Uh, it's pulling you backwards in. So this is the acceleration. Why is it r? Because that's the distance you are from whatever it is you're trying to get away from. r is this distance between you. And so obviously the change in r squared is the acceleration. That's what that's saying to us. Okay. Anyway, so they start off with this deal right here. And then you're like, okay, well, that's cool. Uh, what do you want me to do about that? Well, um, so when you look at that, it, it, it's kind of interesting because um, this guy right here, I could probably write him a different way. Okay? And so, you know, there's several ways to go about it. But one, one thing that you could write it is, is V, um, V dv dr, like so. Now, why would that be true? Okay, think about that for a minute. Why would that be true? V dv dr is equal to this guy right here. Uh, dv dr, and and so, why 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 is that? Well, this is something that they always leave out. Remember that dv dt, right, is equal to, or I or rather I could times it by for instance, dt dr, right? And what would happen? I would get this thing right here, yes? Okay. And I would get dv dr, right? But if I do that, what else do I have to have, right? I mean, I can't just change that randomly and see what happens. I, I can't just do that. I have to be able to make, like, you know, come up with some reason why that might be. So when I change that, that's it's the chain rule that allows me to do that sort of thing. And then I'm like, oh, okay, well, sure, I guess that makes sense, dvdr, okay, right. Um, but I, I've just changed the, in the, uh, the, the way that I'm doing the derivative of that guy, but I have to be careful. So they rewrite this bit right here as velocity times the change in velocity with respect to r, okay. Now, when we come up to that, it's going to make sense, I think, a little bit more in a minute. But let's, start, let's do it this way. So I have dvdt, or I'm sorry dr dt, so dr dt, right, is equal to, right, dr dt is equal to dv dt times dt dr. True? True. Now, I want, I want, doggone it, I want dv dr, okay? And I have currently dvdt right now, yes? And so, this, this is interesting. So when you look at this, there's a couple ways you could rewrite this. So right here, if you divide both sides by dt dr, what do you end up with? Well, you end up with dr squared, or dr squared, t squared, okay? So that's kind of nice. That's one way to do it. Okay, that's not exactly what I want. Now, so... What is, I should say this, when I look at this situation here, here is dr, I, I would like to have velocity. Well, this right here is velocity, when I think about it. Um, yeah, here we go. So here it is right here, I rewrote it for us. So we know that dv dt is equal to dv dt, dv dr times dr dt. That's the chain rule. dr dt is velocity. So velocity times right, dv dr, that's what we have going on right here, okay, is equal to this guy right here. So we're re-changing it out, and what are we getting rid of, oops, what are we getting rid of? We're writing everything in terms of r, because because that's that's what really matters here. It comes to do with how far are you away from uh, the center of the earth when you're playing this game, okay? Now, we know that you've got something pushing on you, and the thing that's pushing on you is thrust, and gravity says, I don't think so. Okay, and so the idea here is is that there 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 will come a velocity where when I get done with this thing in a few minutes there will come a velocity where there is no um, there's zero force act there's zero force acting on me right and and at that point then I'm able to escape able to escape gravity at that point 
okay? And it's, it's kind of a cool deal when you think about it that way. Now, um, it's not very hard to do though. And so, but if you think about this, let's just see what we get here. So at this point, we're, we're, we're down to this point here like so. And so if you say, okay, well, I'm, I'll buy that for a nickel. So, ouch. This is separable again. Right? Integrate, and you're going to have 1 half V squared equals TR, right? Plus GM over R, I believe. Check my math on that. Okay? And it feels pretty good, I think, when I get to that point. And I'm like, okay, well, that's okay, I guess so. Sure, I guess, right? Um, uh, so, there you go. Okay? But now, wait a minute. Just a minute. It feels weird to me. What if, what if we get out there at some point? And we're out, we're going out there, but we have no thrust at all. Okay. Well, if we have no thrust, okay. Well, what do I mean if we have no thrust? Well, if we have no thrust and we're out far enough, right? But we're going fast enough. It doesn't matter what happens. We're not coming back. So if this is zero, you see, this piece just cancels out. In other words, we've gotten up to a fast enough speed that we're not coming back, right? Now remember, when we integrate, there's always that plus C business on the end of it, okay? So here we have V squared is equal to, now I'm just gonna write, I can write it as two C or just C, I think I'm just gonna do it this way, plus two GM over R, and then I'm gonna square root that sucker. Okay, right there. Now, it's interesting to note that that thing right there, whatever it is, should tell us what's going on here. Okay, now, notice up here initially, C is very easy to solve for, right there. C is equal to 1 half V squared minus GM over R, yes? That's what it has to be. So don't go looking for it too hard. It's, it's right there staring you in the eyeballs. That, you know, that's, that's the picture. And so just know that going in, and it's pretty easy to do right there. Now, um, when you plug that back in then, we can, we can come into this guy right here if we wanted to, V squared, and then I'll plug it back in. So, which V would it be, Mr. J? Because it would be, well, that would be V naught, because it would be the initial velocity, because I would have told you some initial velocity to solve for C with, yes? And so what you'd end up with is 1 half V sub naught squared, big G, minus big G over M, over R, minus 2, big G M over R. I shouldn't have square rooted first. So this is nice. And so if you can clean this up, you get this. Hmm. And you and you really want to subtract those guys, but what happens? Oh, that's right. What was the initial What was the initial radius? Whoa, it's the radius of the earth. So keep in mind this is some radius of the Earth, and this is how far out you are. That's your other radius. That one I don't want to change. So this is the radius of the Earth right here. Okay. So if you're careful with that, it's it's kind of fun and kind of neat to see how this all comes and pans out. It's kind of fun actually. I think. Um, I dropped a two. There should be a two right there as well. Yes. So these two both have a two, big G, big M. In them. So if I factor that out, I'm left with 1 over R E minus 1 over R is equal to V squared. Yay. Cool. So if you plug all that business in and solve, you will find that you need to end up with V naught needs to equal the square root of 2 big G, big M over the radius of the Earth, right? That is the, the, the actual radius of the Earth on that deal. And no, oh, sorry. This should be a plus right there. God, I'm frustrating myself today. And what? Did I get those backwards? 
I got those backwards. I'm not sure how I screwed that up. Anyway, that's not really the point of today's lesson. Okay? The idea here is this. If you plug this in, what you will find is you get something like 11.2 kilometers per second. That is escape velocity for Earth. Okay? Which I think is a pretty cool deal. It all works out. Clearly, if you want to get something into orbit and get it away from, not just a, not into orbit, but get it away from the Earth, you need to be able to go in that fast, right? If you're going that fast, Earth's gravity cannot contain you. Now notice that this is for Earth's gravity, right? But this is universal gravitational constant. If it was for Jupiter, this would change, R sub Jupiter. This would be the mass of Jupiter. It would change, but the same thing holds true. And then you can go through and find out just how fast would I need to be traveling to escape each of their velocities, okay? And so, once we work this out, it's kind of a fun deal, I think. It's kind of neat, but it's not really the scope of this class. If you're going to go into rocketry and stuff, that makes a bigger difference to you. Um, kind of butchered this, but you can look through it on your book right there. It's pretty straightforward. A couple of things that I think they kind of do a crappy job of is how they get from here to here. I just think they did a kind of a lousy job of it. It's across the page from it, but it's not, it's not really obvious to most people, I don't think. Um, again, the section on velocities is... It's pretty straightforward, I think. If you've had any physics at all, and I mean any physics at all, you know that the derivative of displacement is velocity and the derivative of velocity is acceleration, so it's pretty easy to do. So I think that's it.